coming up on Network Africa. Ethiopians told to protect capital against Tigray rebels. Sudan's ousted Prime Minister says his government can solve crisis. Plus, vote counting underway in South Africa local election. Hello and welcome to the program. I'm Tenio Lash Shibowale. We begin with Ethiopia's Tigray crisis as authorities in Addis Ababa urge residents to register their private weapons within the next two days. This follows comments by a rebel alliance that it was considering marching on the Ethiopian capital. The Tigrayan People's Liberation Front, the TPLF, which has been fighting government forces for the past year, is now linked up with fighters from an Oromo force, giving the rebels a major boost in their ability to threaten Addis Ababa. Rebel advances have sparked a national call to arms by Ethiopia's Prime Minister and there's a state of emergency in the Amara and Oromia region. Meanwhile, Prime Minister Abiy Ahmed says foreign forces have fought alongside Tigrayan rebels in recent battles in strategically important areas in Amara region. The TPLF has dismissed the allegations. Of more on the situation in the country, we're being joined by Zelalem Tesema, a coordinator for the Defend Ethiopia Task Force. Thank you so much for your time on the program. Thank you for having me. So this conflict is ongoing for nearly a year now. What do you make of the latest developments with authorities urging Ethiopians to take up arms? Well, um, well, let's um, first look into what is the background to this conflict briefly. So the TPLF-led regime, which is supposed to be representing no more than 5% of the Ethiopian population, after 28 years of brutal and repressive regime, has been ousted by popular uprising of the Ethiopian people in 2018 and replaced by the popular government of um, Abiy Ahmed, they couldn't get to terms with the loss of the power and have been undermining the Abiy government. And in uh, November last year, on the 4th of November, they attacked the National Defense Forces. Hence, the government to restore peace and stability in the region has taken action. After that, the, for humanitarian problems, the Ethiopian government declared a unilateral ceasefire in June to give chance for peace. But unfortunately, all that offer has been wasted or fallen on deaf ears. This is also partly because the TPLF has been emblondered by the Western powers because it has been doing their dirty work mainly in Africa, particularly in the Horn of Africa. So there are evidences coming out that, that the West have been providing political, diplomatic, and also intelligence support to the TPLF, who are declared to be a terrorist organizations. And using that ceasefire, they regrouped themselves and rearmed themselves and invaded neighboring regions. They are not only massacring people, they are killing everything on that is moving on earth, including cattle. So only the other day that they have um, moved into a strategic town, uh, small insurgencies came and Basically, they have massacred women and children to the tune of about 110 people. Hence, yes, the Ethiopian government, I mean, when the um, sovereignty and stability of the country is at stake, this is um, something that, that Ethiopians historically have been um, known for defending their freedom. So it has made a call to the Ethiopian people, rightly so in my view, because these forces are 
um, terrorists like what you would have like Boko Haram in Nigeria, no different from that. So it is incumbent upon the government to make a call for people to join arms or to raise arms in, in defense of peace and stability in the country. You know, not much information is really coming out of Ethiopia in terms of there's been reports of atrocities committed by both sides. But let's take a look at what's happening now and what we're hearing with the TPLF and Oromo rebels now joining force. There are fears that they could advance to the capital. What would this capture and the Tigray forces returning to power uh, mean for this conflict? Well... Uh, I wouldn't go that far because the Oromo Liberation Front, which has been in the scene for the last um, 60, 70 years, um, not sure even what their agenda is. Uh, for goodness sake, Ethiopia now is led by, it is, has got, well, nine regions of which one is Oromia, and the, 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 the leader of the country is from that region. Proportionally, there is more representations in Ethiopia from the Oromo region. So as far as uh, sort of I'm aware, the Oromo question has been largely been answered. I don't know what the extremist Oromo um, fighters or OLF are trying to achieve in this situation. In terms of the, which is also a fragmented sort of uh, force which has achieved nothing in the last 60 or 70 years anyway. So they're joining the TPLF, in my view, yeah, yes. I mean, they have said that for, um, well, about, now about two months ago that they have issued communicate that they are joining forces. But I mean, let's put this in perspective, okay? Ethiopians who are looking for peace and stability in their country and who have, have sacrificed in millions under the brutal repressive regime of the TPLF, I don't think they would be prepared to give up their freedom just like that. And we're talking about uh, millions of people who have got popular backing from every region in the country. I mean, except uh, probably Tigray. There are Oromos who are fighting for peace and fighting for freedom within the government, government forces and they are still being sort of recruited and coming to fight and defend the country. So I wouldn't read too much into that. Yes, it is um, a headache for the government, but I think I don't think Ethiopians will be kneeling down. But probably the TPLF might have won the propaganda war, and Ethiopians, uh, I think, need to be matching that by things that are happening on the ground. All right, then, Zelalem Tassima, a coordinator for the Defend Ethiopia Task Force. Thank you so much for your thoughts on the program. Thanks for having me. And still in Ethiopia, the nearly year-long conflict between the central government and the ruling party of the northern region has taken its toll on the country's ancient cultural heritage sites. As the war continues, Ethiopians are taking stock of losses to their prized cultural heritage. Fento Alemu, a tour guide who fled fighting in Lalibela to Addis Ababa, sits with his family looking through photographs of his time working in UNESCO World Heritage Site. The country's year-long conflict has destroyed ancient churches and mosques, some reportedly damaged by shelling, others looted. Countless others are inaccessible for worshippers seeking to pray or make pilgrimages. Fento says there is no evidence of damage or looting of Lalibela and a buffer zone has been established around the perimeter. No harm has been done to the church according to the information I have so far. A buffer zone has been set around the church. An area has been designated where people cannot go beyond that line. Some of Prophet Muhammad's first disciples came to what is now called Ethiopia to escape persecution in Mecca. They were welcomed and given refuge by the Exumiti Kingdom whose capital was Aksum in Tigray. Historians say some of these disciples built al Najashi Mosque. Although many disciples eventually returned to current-day Saudi Arabia, 15 are said to be buried at the mosque. Where there are conflicts, treasures disappear, get stolen or damaged. Therefore, our treasures are in danger at this moment because of this conflict. 
Today, the city is still dotted with several ancient engraved stone columns. It is considered a rich archaeological site. Tens of thousands of Ethiopian Christians normally visit for the festival of Sion Mariam, celebrated at the end of November. Over in North Africa, Sudan's ousted Prime Minister Abdullah Hamdok says his dissolved government could solve the current political crisis after the military takeover. The information ministry that's still loyal to the Prime Minister said he spoke during a meeting with foreign ambassadors at his home. Mr. Amdok is still under house arrest. The cabinet was dissolved after a coup on October the 25th. There's been protests against the military in the capital and other cities. The international community has also been calling for the military to relinquish power. In South Africa, counting is underway after citizens cast their votes in the local government elections. The vote is being seen as a test to the popularity of the ruling ANC party. According to the electoral body, the voter turnout of Monday's elections is not yet clear, but it came amid apathy with a third of eligible voters not having registered. Our correspondent Brian Pugeni joins us now for an update. Brian, it was a big day for South Africans on Monday. Just give us an idea of how the exercise went overall around the country. Um, good afternoon. Thank you for having me. Um, well, yes, um, South Africans took to the ballots yesterday for the local government elections. Um, over 12 million people are reported to have voted, but that's a very low voter rate um, 10 out if, um, because there were 26.2 million registered voters but only 12, uh, 12 million of those people managed to go and cast their ballots but that's, we, we don't have the final number yet from the IEC but that's what's um, being speculated and this is a far cry from the 42.6 eligible people who are, who are eligible to vote in the country so the voter turnout is very low um, mostly from young people we're seeing young people not going to exercise their right to vote which is a big concern for the country because young people are the ones who, who have got them who are the future of the of, of the country and those young people have not taken the step to go out and vote. So counting is on the way now. Any indications from votes counted so far? Well, yes, at the moment, um, the IEC is releasing votes as, as um, by the minute. Um, at the moment, 42% has been counted um, overall nationally. Um, we're seeing the ruling national uh, ANC um, in the lead in most places. Um, they've got a total of 47% of the votes at the moment. Um, they're quite popular, almost reaching the 4 million mark um, of voters. Um, we're seeing the DA, which is the main opposition, also um, reach um, uh, at the moment at 1.9 million voters. That's, um, that's accounting for like 22% of, of, of the votes, and they have 429 seats at the moment. Um, the, the second opposition, which is the Economic Freedom Fighters, the EFF, at the moment standing at over 800,000 um, voters, um, which, is, which accounts for almost 10% of the counted votes. Um, that's what we're seeing at the moment. And we're seeing um, in places like Wazulu Natal, the IFP is really pushing the ANC. The IFP at the moment has got over 27% of that area. Um, we're looking at the Western Cape as well, which is a strong a stronghold for the Democratic Alliance, the, the DA, which at the moment is over 63% of the votes, um, which we know that's a very strong, um, very strong stronghold for, for, for the DA. The ANC in that area, um, they are, it's quite shaky. Um, but the, more, the much anticipated is Gauteng. We're still waiting for those results. There's three in quite slow at the moment, mm. but we'll keep an eye on that one. Um, we'll give you an update as the, as the numbers go on. Uh, so when can we expect a final official results? Well, um, the IEC is saying the official results will be out on Thursday the 4th, um, but they're saying by tonight they will have counted over 90% of the votes. So maybe tomorrow we might have a clearer picture, but the official results, uh, they're saying, will be on Thursday the 4th. And then, Brian, thanks so much for bringing us up to speed. Thank you so much.
To security matters, the army in Mali says three Chinese citizens who were kidnapped in July have escaped their captors and have been rescued by security forces. Armed men seized the three men from a construction site in the south of the country. Two Mauritanians abducted at the same time were freed 10 days later. In a statement, the army said the hostages had managed to break free on Sunday and were located the following day in a joint operation in involving ground and air forces. The men are said to be in reasonable health. Still to come on the program. African leaders call for more financial commitments to fight climate change at the ongoing COP26 summit. Please stay with us. Thanks for staying with us. Morocco has introduced a COVID-19 vaccination pass to give citizens access to restaurants and other public places. This has triggered protests on the streets with opponents attacking the pass as unconstitutional and a danger to the economy. Civilians and lawmakers in Morocco decry last week's introduction of COVID-19 vaccine pass to access public places. According to the health minister, since the government introduced the pass last week, registration to receive the jab has increased fivefold. Citizens are now required to present the document for access to all government buildings, as well as spaces such as cafes, restaurants, cinemas, gyms, and transportation. What we do is ask people for their vaccination pass. The biggest problem was the number of people left the cafe when we ask them to show their passes. But we do this by order of the authorities. According to the opposition members, there was insufficient consultation and too little notice before imposing the pass. Health Minister Khalid H. Talib says in the next few weeks, Morocco will be able to vaccinate 6 million people to reach a collective immunity level of 80% of its population over 12 years old. People have come out to protest with one demand, which is the respect for the right to choose. Citizens have the right to choose whether or not to get vaccinated. Imposing obligatory vaccination is contrary to the international and national laws. At the same time, it is arbitrary against citizens. Morocco has so far administered doses to 64% of its population using mostly the AstraZeneca, Sinopharm and Pfizer vaccines. It has also started administering boosted jabs. African leaders have been speaking at the ongoing COP26 summit in Glasgow, Scotland. In his remarks, President Mohamed Buhari said Nigeria is committed to net zero by 2060, while highlighting the devastating impact of climate change in the Lake Chad and northern Nigeria. He says officials are working to ensure a more stable energy market and have developed a detailed energy transition plan and roadmap. However, the president says attaining in the global climate goal would require financial support to developing countries. I do not think anyone in Nigeria needs persuading of the need for urgent action on the environment. The certification in the north, floods in the center, pollution and erosion on the coast are enough evidence for Nigeria climate change is not about the perils of tomorrow, 
But what is happening today, Nigeria is committed to net zero by 2060. In our lifetime, Lake Chad has gone from a vast expense of biodiversity to a shadow of itself. We are investing in renewables, hydro dams, and solar projects. Nigeria is not looking to make the same mistakes that have been repeated for decades by others. We are looking for partners in innovation, technology, and finance to make cleaner and more efficient use of all available resources to help make for a more stable transition in energy markets. The revised nationally determined contribution has additional priority sectors, water and waste, nature-based solutions, adaptation and resilience, vulnerability assessment, and a clean cooking, gender, and green jobs assessment, bottom-up renewable energy transition pathway to 2030. Parties to the Paris Agreement are expected to transit from fossil fuel to clean energy and reach a net zero ambition for greenhouse gases emission. Well, taking his turn to address delegates on day two of the COP26 summit, Ghanaian President Nana Akufo Addo says that climate change is the greatest threat to the realization of the sustainable development goals, as it has an enormous impact on the fundamentals required for survival on Earth. Calling on Western nations to do more, President Nana Akufo Addo highlights that even though Africa is responsible for less than 4% of the global volume of carbon emissions, the continent suffers the impact of climate change the most. We're naturally very disappointed by the failure of the wealthy nations to honor their commitments of making available $100 billion annually to the poorer countries to assist us in the fight against climate change, and by the unavailability of the technology transfer that will help us find sustainable ways of charting a path out of this existential crisis. Those same nations are, however, insisting that we abandon the opportunity for rapid development of our economies. That would be tantamount to enshrining in the global community inequality of the highest order, a totally unacceptable conclusion. For Zimbabwean President Emerson Mnangagwa, he says his country has not been left out of the devastating impact of climate change. He also criticized sanctions placed on his country while calling on richer countries to do more to fight the crisis. Zimbabwe has not been spared from climate change challenges, which have led to an increasing frequency of severe droughts and cyclone-induced floods. These coupled with the economic sanctions imposed on us and the COVID-19 pandemic have had negative impacts on the lives and livelihoods of the people of my country. The importance of solidarity and cooperation to tackling global challenges cannot be overemphasized. It is most unfortunate that the impact of climate change is disproportionately borne by the vulnerable communities which have contributed the least to the current stock of atmospheric carbon. Vulnerable countries must therefore be capacitated to mitigate, adapt, and build resilience to climate change. The expectation is that major emitters will scale up 
mitigation action and show greater interest in adaptation. Decisions at this COP26 should strengthen the implementation of current national determined contributions. And Tanzania's President Samaya Suluhu Hassan also addressed the Climate Change Summit in Glasgow. She explained how a country has experienced impacts of climate change, calling upon the world uh, to act fast on the matter. I take this podium to address the scourge of our time, the climate change. We in Tanzania have not been spared by these events. Sea level rise is eating at arable land. Our pride, the Mount Kilimanjaro, is drastically becoming bald due to glacier melting. And un uh, we are experiencing unpredictable floods and droughts. We are experiencing all this despite our resolve to dedicate 48 million hectares to forest conservation as global service to carbon sequestration. Our exotic and beautiful archipelago of Zanzibar is struggling with temperature rises, saltwater intrusion, and inundation thus impacting its tourism ecology. Excellencies, what does all this mean to a poor country like Tanzania? It means 30% of our GDP that comes from agriculture, forestry, and fisheries is not sustainable. Sadly, the big resolve and re robust steps to combat causes and effects of climate change are still low paced. The Paris goal of achieving 1.5 degrees Celsius is yet to be made, while more commitment are required. We in Tanzania are determined to take swift actions as our inaction means risking our development agenda and prosperity. What we all ought to remember is when the drastic climate changes hit, it will choose no location, might or weak, poor or rich country. And so we call upon an urgent unlocking of a climate financing that will trigger plant targets and implementation of the NDC. Well, that's the program today. Thank you so much for watching. I'm Tenny Ola Shubo Ali.